The date is Friday, June 11th, and you're listening to Entertain This, a thought-provoking podcast encapsulating all things entertainment. In this episode, we're discussing the 1998 release of a critically acclaimed film called Saving Private Ryan. Beyond the fact that it's one of the most famous World War II movies of all time, we think it's worth a watch for so many more reasons than that. So enjoy! Welcome once again, ladies and gentlemen. You have once again ventured into our little neck of the woods. You're listening to your favorite show on the internet covering all things entertainment. It's Entertain This! Entertain This! No! Chloe's sitting in the seat that does that. Oh, sorry. So she has to do it. Let's do it again. Welcome, everybody. You are listening to your favorite show on the internet encapsulating all things entertainment. It's Entertain This! entertain this <laughs> yes <laughs> awesome uh, as you guys it was great you did Perfecto. great uh as you guys can clearly see uh we've given michael the week off um for personal reasons he is gonna take this week off but he will be back next week uh to host a very special episode that he is compiling and composing right now which we're all very excited about wow. but without further ado uh let's get into the show I'm Alex. I'm Chloe. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm Nick. <laughs> we really should start <laughs> we should start queuing things more often and letting people in on our little bits. <laughs> I guess we got so used to just go ahead and, and doing it. Before we get started today, because I don't want to make it a quick this and because I want to talk about it, have you guys seen the iCarly trailer for the new iCarly show that's coming out? No, sorry, I live under a rock. I watched it, but I didn't have any okay. audio playing. <laughs> damn. Then you missed Spencer Shea saying the word damn to prove that this time they're edgy. Let's get oh. into the real show today. <laughs> okay. Ooh, Let's, edgy. Let, that's it. That's all I wanted to say. Let's get into it. Great. This is, <laughs> this, is your, this is your week, Nick. So you go ahead and, and take the mantle. And you're making that face you always make when I tell you that it's your week. <laughs> Yep, I know it's same my week. Face. For those Come of you on. who are listening to the audio version of the podcast, remember that if you want to see the weird faces that Nick makes, because he is a <laughs> meme lord, you can always check out our episodes with a video feed on our YouTube, as well as live every Friday on the Seed yeah. channel. Yes, nice plug there. That was um, an effortless plug. It is my week, of course. Um, I do have something to talk about, and we'll get into it. We'll get to it for sure. Um. But first off, I want to ask you just just right off the bat, what do you know about the uh, the the conflict known as World War II? Uh, I know that Captain America punched Hitler right in the jizzle <laughs> on stage. Yeah, he did. <laughs> it's true in the comics too, but in the comics it was legitimately Hitler. He like ran up and punched real Hitler in the face. Actual Hitler. Actual yeah. Hitler Shia LaBeouf. No, no. <laughs> he had it coming, if we're honest, right? Yeah. Did well, a lot of bad things. Yeah. I mean, hey, you play bad. stupid games, you get stupid prizes. <laughs> That's a good subreddit. Nice, nice plug there. <laughs> it was bad, right? It was a bad, yep. it was a bad time for everyone involved. Called maybe. it World was War it? because a lot of people were involved. A lot of countries. It was, it was bad for our, for the people of the world. It was yeah. great for the economy. Mm. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, you see the birth of the uh, military industrial complex shortly afterwards. But um, I'd like to more talk about uh, the memories involved with war. Uh, as you know, humans were kind of memory machines. We're walking hard drives with the, with the lossy format. Uh, for starters, I think I'd like you to tell me of it the last time that you smelled something and it brought back a, a vivid memory in your head. Hmm. hmm. I'm trying to think. <laughs> I recently did. Um, I was home and I cracked open this old book I used to read when I was a kid. Oh. And somehow it like still had the smell of this pasta my mom used to make. So I don't. I don't know if it was real or if I was hallucinating or having a stroke, but <laughs> it was a pretty wholesome moment for me. So, 
it's always those wholesome memories, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think the smell that kind of sticks out to me or brings back flashbacks the most often is like the smell of school supplies. Because like mm. working at the Red Menace and walking into aisles that are filled with nothing but school supplies in the back room, <laughs> it's like, ah, shit, that's what like first grade smelled like. That's not. <laughs> Lots of erasers and glue and pencils, oh, yeah. markers. It was, uh, it's always the construction paper that gets me. It mm -hmm. has a certain smell to it, doesn't it? It does. You're like, oh, yeah, I it remember. It smells like getting things. yelled at for wasting all of the construction paper on paper airplane. <laughs> <laughs> I needed the purple. Too bad. I got the red. <laughs> it was, it was memories like that, that, that just, uh, either haunt you or, you know, keep that warm and tingly feeling alive in your heart. I don't know. True. But uh, our memories can be nice to recall or bring back some horrible imagery from the time you wasted paper, Alex. Um, and maybe even make you erupt with anger at a person who wronged you before. And undoubtedly, the veterans of the Second World War are reminded every year of the trauma that occurred on June 6th, 1944. And this date marked a very important day in history, the amphibious landing and attack on mainland France by Allied troops, otherwise known as everyone... D-Day, yeah, woo! See, our <laughs> no. fact checker's here, so I don't have to answer <laughs> questions like that. Very nice. I'm trying to do the, the class participation thing that history teachers failed to do. Yeah, I like yeah. it. Mm. I'm, trying, I'm always okay? here for class participation. <laughs> I didn't also, see we're coming up on that. It's June 3rd, so that's three days from now. Yeah, a peek behind the curtain. We record uh, a week in advance, but I think when this episode drops, we'll be past it. So. Yeah, but we're All live, too, so... Oh, snap. Yeah. Well, shout out to our one person watching live. Uh, <laughs> there's there's a thousand people. What are you talking about? Um, You're right. <laughs> no. Just they're invisible to our sight metrics. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no. For those of you listening to our podcast later on, I just dabbed on camera. Wow. Anyway, war memories. War, yes. War is bad. Um, war is hell, some might say. But um, war. World War II is one of those subjects. Yeah. And war never changes, Alex. Um, yeah. <laughs> every arm hair, armchair, not arm hair, that'd be kind of weird. Historian <laughs> likes to talk about uh, maybe making a few terrible jokes along the way. I know I've been there too, but um, to their credit, World War II is a big freaking deal for a lot of reasons. If this topic was the only thing you recall from your history class, I think you're off to a great start. And up until now, I've kind of teased this full frontal assault on the topic brief hat tips, you know, tongue in cheek references among them. But now is finally my chance to talk a little bit about this with you and our audience. So it seems once again, you found yourself in Mr. Thick Nick's history class. But you might ask, why should I care about something that happened 80 years ago? Like, like we said before, history never repeats itself, but it often rhymes. You know what I mean <laughs> by that? It always repeats itself. That's <laughs> why we have to learn. Yeah, that's it. I do like the take because everyone always is like history repeats itself but mm -hmm. i have always heard you say like history doesn't repeat itself it but it does rhyme it's like you're right because it does repeat itself but it's more the patterns that repeat rather than everything that happens yeah it's like i like uh, that a lot the first time you said it, i was like oh that's spicy <laughs> <laughs> i don't know who i got it from but it's it's so true it might have been abraham lincoln quote uh, <laughs> somebody can fact check me on that later if you want to Ooh. um not right now she's she's hosting she's ho okay <laughs> <laughs> do it in the background but really history is all about basic cause and effect right it's because of yesterday that we are here today dealing with the things that yesterday caused cause and effect pretty much mm -hmm. um what, what history really is good is seeing a different perspective on humanity and our societies that's what it's good for and all the good and bad ways that we interact with one, each other, one another. And if anything, I'd like you to come away with perspective at the end of this episode, as I ask you to walk a mile in somebody else's boots as we save Private Ryan, and I ask you to entertain this. And change your nice. socks. Change your socks. Yeah, you're going to get gangrene. To keep it Take up. care of <laughs> your feet. Even your Forrest feet. Gump knew that. Yeah. <laughs> um. So let and me that's ask a one counter on our Forrest Gump reference. Uh, and that's the second one. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I won't say stop. it again. 
Um, we're not here to talk about Forrest Gump, but if you want me to, I can I can maybe do a little episode on that. Maybe in the future, just saying. Write it down. Write it down. Write it down. Nobody okay. can steal it. <laughs> TM TM TM. R circle circle game. Um, can war be a good thing? Do you guys think it can be a good thing? Do you think good things can come out of it? You know, I like to quote um, a, a pretty influential group in my life, personally. Uh, the quote goes, war, what is it good for? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Well done. Yeah, I don't think there is really... There's good things that can happen within a war, but... By and large, I don't think it's a very good experience for anyone involved. No, I mean, war is always a means to an end, and the end is always peace, right? Like, it's like an on-off switch, because either you're at war or you're at peace. Yeah. Like, there's really no in-between, um, because even when you're, like, tensions are brewing and war is on the horizon, you're still peaceful. It's like an on-off switch. And if the end goal is always peace for war i mean then then what's the point you know well i don't know if it's a necessarily... i need a reference for a scum that time <laughs> i just was saying a lot of hippie stuff it's yeah, ultimately um one of the things where it's you know what how do we make peace in the end is it is it with a treaty is it with reparations is it um is it somewhere in between where we just kind of stop fighting for a while and we're just like you know what this has been draining I'm just going to call it quits. I'm going to go home, you guys. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done playing with my toys. Uh, but war is kind of one of those ways that humans interact with one another. Um, you don't see it with many other animal species. So I'd almost call it a uniquely human experience. Remember how we said hell is other people in a previous episode? That was last episode. Yeah, yeah. you did say that. This is yet another depiction of that very phrase. And we're just very ven vengeful creatures. You rub us the wrong way and... You're going to want payback, right? Part of that is just the fact that it feels good to get back at someone, if only just to get even. So let me ask you this. Was there ever a time when you were a kid that you sought revenge on someone else? Dude, I have buried that shit so deep in my subconscious. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tell you. If I did, it was out of spite, and I so quickly either forgot about it or rationalized it to the point of not making it a permanent memory that I probably will not track back to tell you about some time that I sought revenge on somebody. Mm. F in the chat for Alex's memories. <laughs> Disassociative episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot you. I'm pretty sure there were a couple times in elementary school. I did have this one girl who was... I mean, she wasn't just like specifically mean to me. She was mean to everybody, but I try to avoid being a snitch as much as possible. But <laughs> I, I did go to some teachers over the way she was talking to other kids. Very nice. Chloe's a narc. Pass it on. Just shut up. <laughs> I'm only a narc for justice. That's what all narcs say. I was just doing my job. Uh <laughs> I was never a hall monitor. If that hall monitor. Helped. SpongeBob. <laughs> Uh, but anyways the reason why i brought up being a kid in school uh, is because that's kind of when we're in our developmental phase right we're we're figuring things out we're learning how to interact with people and uh every so often we'll 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 get this hot anger that we don't know what to do with and sometimes our tempers flare uh you could say the same thing about you know countries interacting with one another too damn it so, i remembered a time okay let's hear it <laughs> I was playing football in the front yard at my friend Ben's house uh -huh. and 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 I was on Ben's team and Ben had a twin brother named Jeff and 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 we had another friend over named Isaac so we were playing two on two and okay. and, and, and I play peewee football so I thought that I would be better at it than everyone so I was playing quarterback on my team <laughs> and, and, and so so I threw a pass to Ben but but Isaac called it a forward lateral and so and so and so I took the ball and I yelled forward lateral this and then I hit him in the face <laughs> <laughs> that's a true story and then I said entertain this and I hit you in the face no. <laughs> <laughs> this is entertainment 
<laughs> this is you a forward him lateral. I yeah, you. his he he started crying, which was embarrassing because his girlfriend was sitting on the electric <laughs> box across the street. Yikes. If that's not suburban white America, I don't know what is. <laughs> Y'all should hey, not have sorry, been sorry, Isaac. Me neither. Nope. Hey, Isaac, that's my bad, man. I'm sorry that it, that happened, and I'm sorry that I brought it up on my incredibly successful podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm going to explain World War II like this, okay? If, a little background for you. Let's, let's imagine the conflict is a playground scuffle, okay? You're on the playground. You're sipping some tea with your friends, and you're maybe eating some croissants, and you're just having a good time. You're really Why? taking me out of this. Okay, I'll get there. Don't worry. <laughs> But <laughs> okay, tea and croissants. Yep. So this short kid comes onto the playground with a few of his Nick friends. Went to private school. That's that's not true, Alex. Okay, yeah, it is. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> the short art kid comes onto the playground with a few of his friends, and he's from the other side of the recess field. You've you've seen him around in school, and he's always screaming and yelling about something. It seems we'll call him Isaac. We'll call him uh, Harold. Oh, <laughs> he shows up and he says, Hey, you see that slide over there? That's mine. So you're like, okay, whatever, dude, that's cool. I don't, I don't want to use the slide anyway. So we're good. I, I'm just going to sit here on the rock wall. You know, we don't want no, we don't want no trouble. But if you claim those monkey bars over there, we're going to have a problem. So that's all well and good. And the guy from the other side of the field says, yeah, that's cool. I understand. I won't claim the monkey bars. Now, a few days have passed. The fellow from the other side of the field shows up again and he's sitting on his newly claimed slide and he's looking pretty pleased with himself. But he's got a few more kids with him. He started gathering a little a little following here. Mm, he's got a posse. Yeah. And you remember the last time a friend of his from another part of town, the same part of town that he is in, pulled something like that the previous school year. And you went and snitched on him to a teacher. <laughs> and he remembers that too. <laughs> and his friend still has to stay after school and clean lunch tables as a punishment. A whole year later? A whole year later. This That's school rad. sucks, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little unfair, right? But anyways, he wants him to be free after school so he can go and play his Nintendo 64. So today he decides, you know what? I'm going to say those monkey bars are mine. And at this point, your friends are like, bro, seriously? So previously you said that was a red line, but honestly, you don't have a lot of people around you. So this kid has a whole bunch of friends around him. So if worse comes to worse and you get in a fist fight, you're going to get clobbered. So you say, all right, bro. Last warning. If you get on those swings, we're done playing nice. So a few days pass, and he's once again collected a couple more followers, and he strolls up to the swings and starts proclaiming about how they were really his from the start of school. So you and your friends are pissed. There's no teacher around to tell him this time. So to make matters, you take matters into your own hands, and there you kind of have it. That's the start of World War II. Are you guys following? Yes. Okay, okay so, now can we insert the real characters? Yes. And so <laughs> <laughs> you and your friends, British are, are British and French. Okay. Okay. So Britain and France, they're they're chilling, they're eating croissants, they're drinking tea. Right. Ah. The art kid is actually. I was Hitler. gonna say you're a little British school kid. It, that's yeah, that's pretty much yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so yeah, the art kid from the other side of the, that's that's Hitler, obviously. And he comes over and he takes um he takes Sudeten land. So you're like, that's not cool. Now he takes um, Austria, one of the one of the countries over there, and then the final last straw is Poland, of course, when he invades Poland in 1939, September. The monkey, the monkey bars. The monkey bars. There you go. Do you guys that understand was the it last now? Freaking straw, Hitler. <laughs> now you've <laughs> really on, peeped bro. us off. You can have Germany. You can pretend World War One wasn't a big deal, but you will <laughs> never, never, ever take our monkey bars. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much how it happens. Um, now to draw one more comparison here, let's say you've got a uh, a younger brother. And he's like the star of the football team. And he's he's been working out. So he's he's a little beefy, right? Oh, this is America, isn't it? This is America. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> He's been um, doing some steroids, snorting some protein maybe, powder. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> he shaves, you know. He shaves. <laughs> he he's has only to. 10, but he shaves. <laughs> and he's, yeah, 10. I was about to say, he's 10 years old. <laughs> but he shaves. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't have any more metaphors, I don't think, at this point. But. Basically, you know, Pearl Harbor happens in December 7th of 1941. The yep. uh, 
Imperial Japan is pissed off at us because we had an oil embargo on them and they kind of need oil to invade places. So they spat on us. So they said, hey, threw down their gauntlet, slapped us across the face. <laughs> but the problem here is that Japan they held us down giant. And, and they farted on us. Yeah, they farted on us, if we're doing the kid metaphor. And then everyone <laughs> called us fart boy. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't no fart boy. <laughs> yeah, you are. So what we do in response, we shit on them twice. <laughs> and everyone was like, whoa, dude, did you just shit on that kid? And we were like, he farted on me like two weeks ago. <laughs> so it's fine. Yeah, it's just, it's this pattern of like minor annoyance. And then Is this maybe the most insensitive metaphor. <laughs> no, we'll get we'll get to the well, I, part. I think at least I'm saying like, hey, I think we took it a little too far. Yeah. A lot of that the countries sure. did, I think. Like the end of World War One, we saddled Germany with all these reparations and we're like, you're gonna pay us like, I don't know, uh think of a number, a billion dollars every day for all the stuff you did in World War One. <laughs> and Germany's like, Bro, I can't afford that. They're like, Well, that's tough. You're just gonna have to deal with it. So <laughs> Well, we do have to kind of remember that in all honesty, once the like United Nations were formed, I don't know if that was exactly after World War One, was, was it? Yeah. We all basically were like, all right, we all messed up, but yeah. let's all blame Germany. <laughs> and everyone uh, everyone at the same time said, hmm, yes. And so okay. Germany did kind of get the bill for something that was everyone's fault. Yeah. And that is the anger that Germans had at the time. Did Th they this was after World War go I too far? Yes. Of. Yeah. They did. Yeah. Like, absolutely. And then after World War II, we kind of, we didn't exactly force them to pay reparations, but we took a lot of them to trial for, you know, the bad shit they were doing. And it was pretty bad. Let's be honest with that. Bad. But um, by the time Second World War ends, we're kind of like, all right, you know what? Let's just get together. Let's have a United Nations. Let's never do this World War thing again because it's bad. Okay. Hey, this, no isn't way a, this isn't a history podcast. This isn't even a myth story podcast. <laughs> hey, Alex. I want to talk about entertainment now. <laughs> <laughs> not doing the bit you know that he loves to provide context <laughs> yeah i'm done with my context i'm pretty much done with it but um <laughs> in typical it's not even a mystery podcast <laughs> <laughs> in typical entertain this fashion i wanted to know what is this movie really about and you know we like to look beyond the plot and the actors and the locations and i think i've got a pretty good idea but i i want to know what you think is at the core of this what is the thing that the Director said, this is what I want the audience to feel at the end of this film. I assume it you is, guys have watched it. Sorry. <laughs> yes. It okay. is, as much as it is a movie about World War II, this story could take place in any war. Yep. Because it's not the war that you're paying attention to. It is the brotherhood that is created when two men are fighting next to each other for their lives yeah. and what they will do uh, to help those who have that bond with them. That mm -hmm. is what Saving Private Ryan is. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, partially. Uh, cool. I'll let Chloe explain first. <laughs> you, you have an idea of what this movie's about? Um, I mean, I would agree. I think what makes a war movie good and interesting um, isn't necessarily like a focus on what's going on, but it picks something, you know, centralized to focus on, like a band of brothers or one particular ship, uh, like a crew kind of thing. Um, and when you have those characters that you care about, you engage more. It's easy to look back at these huge wars and just be like, I mean, so many people died. How can you contextualize it? And these movies give you some kind of frame of reference. Yeah. Um, Nick, are you going to argue that this movie is about the bridge scene? Because you're right, but also. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll get to what I think about it at a later okay. date. Okay. At a later date, at a later time. I'm not going to. Yeah, it's going to be today. Yeah, it's it going to be today. <laughs> It's going to be in maybe 40 minutes or so. Um, we don't do two parters here. And plus, no, sir. the the El Guapo show starts at eight. So <laughs> we have to be out of here before then. And we have to have the floor swept. Yeah. Oh, no. And the chairs <laughs> stacked and everything. Yeah, seriously. It's like, a oh, my thing. goodness. So, 
I won't sit here and you know belabor the plot at all because you guys kind of know the plot, right? It's uh, it's these group of guys that are in a uh, in a squad. Um, I think that's the actual military term for it. It's a group of I think ten ten guys. Um, at this time, it's it's guys because women aren't allowed in combat roles at right. this point. Um, I think that's changing here soon, but <clears throat> it's eight guys. But they're looking guys. for the ninth. Hey, mm. fact checker. Hey. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> they're looking for the the ninth guy, but he's not part of the um, the group that was formed around Tom Hanks. Uh, Tom Hanks's character because he's he's a captain and he kind of leads this squad. He's been handpicked by the uh, U.S. Army brass to lead this mission into the heart of France to find Private Ryan. And the reason he's over there doing this is because, I mean, this is an order directly from the top. George C. Marshall was the um, allied chain of command. He, he's the head honcho over Europe, pretty much. Think of him like that. Um, and he says he's looking at these reports of these fatalities that have occurred um, within the last, I don't know, year or so. And, you know, th- it cuts to the scene of the ladies typing on typewriters and the lady's like, oh, my goodness, because she sees that two people with the same last name have died uh, recently. And he's getting ready to type her a letter to uh, to his mother, of course. And uh, he's like, oh, my goodness, look at this. And, and then George C. Marshall is like. He recalls this letter from Abraham Lincoln at this point, and he's it's uh I have the quote right here. It's it's uh it's pretty it's pretty heart wrenching, but it says, Dear Madam, and of course it's written in typical Abraham Lincoln style, which is you know very flowery language, of course, but <laughs> very formal. Very formal too. This guy like spent a, a year in Harvard or something. <laughs> I don't know where he actually went to school, but here's the quote, oh. okay? <laughs> so <laughs> I've been shown in the files of the War Department a statement of the Adjutant General of Massachusetts that you are the mother of five sons who have died gloriously on the field of battle. I feel how weak and fruitless must these words of mine, which should attempt to beguile you from the grief of a loss so overwhelming. But I cannot refrain from tendering to you the consolation that might be found in the thanks of the Republic they they died to save. Hmm. I pray to our Heavenly Father that may assuage you of anguish of your bereavement and leave you only the cherished memory of the loved and lost and the solemn pride that must be yours to have laid so costly a sacrifice upon the altar of freedom. Yours and very sincerely and respectively, A. Lincoln. A man who did not go to college. Wow, really? Yep, didn't go. Hmm. He went through high school and he said, all right, I'm done, peace. Peace. Something like Pretty that. Pretty sure he was homeschooled, if I remember correctly. Mm, that, that's possible. That does yeah. sound right. But anyway, this movie isn't about Abraham Lincoln. It's just about, <laughs> that's called the Bixby letter. Uh, it has nothing to do with Samsung phones or anything like that. That's just the, the lady's name that he wrote the letter to. So basically, five of her sons died. And George C. Marshall, the, the head honcho of Europe, says, you know what? We're not going to let that happen in this war. Because this is a good war. <laughs> <laughs> So many people this have said that. This different. This is different, but it's really not. It's all the same. But basically, three of his four brothers die in various theaters of war. Private Ryan, of course, is separated from the people that are landing on the beach because he's in the airborne um, kind of regiment. So he parachutes into France. He's way behind enemy lines. And we're like, all right, we got to bring him home because the rest of his brothers just died. And when generals tell you to do something, you fucking do it. Okay. Mm. <laughs> you get it done. So that's the premise for the movie, okay? And eventually they do find Private Ryan, so I guess, spoiler warning there, but um, (laughs) the way this movie kind of starts is there's this old guy walking across the cemetery, and he stops at this one gravestone, and he just starts crying for no reason. You know, like, all right, what's going on here? And then it cuts to, of course, the famous beach landing scene where, uh, you know, uh, Tom Hanks' character, who is... I think his name is Captain Miller. Yeah, Miller. Yep. He's on the boat and he's he's holding something in his hand and he's shaking. He's shaking like this. He's got a tremor of some sort. And most people will call that PTSD nowadays, but um it, it's established early on just with that with that up close shot of his hand shaking. So eventually they do get on the beach. Um there's these landing craft that are kind of like boats, except imagine the front of a boat, but it flips open. Mm-hmm. So probably not the best design to be landing uh on a beach with machine guns with but that's neither here nor there they um 
these people are just getting mowed down right in front of them. Like there's, there's no way around it. It's, it's a com- complete bloodbath, literally a bloodbath because they're spilling all their blood and guts in the water. And, uh, some men just flat out drown because they miscalculated, uh, how deep the, the actual beaches were before they landed on them because this was a time before GPS and we had to rely on, you know, aerial reconnaissance and all this other stuff to do the math and figure out how deep this water is. And they were a little off on that. So mm-hmm. cost a lot of lives. It's one of these horrible truths of warfare where they're on the beach and people are getting mowed down and there's, there's a medic going around and he's calling out these numbers and these are triage numbers. Triage of course means like, uh, you know, you have level three or something like that. Those are the people that are pretty much dead. Um, level two is like, we have to treat them absolutely right now. And then triage level one is like, they can wait for medical treatment. So it's one of those horrible truths. It's like when you're in combat, you have to deal with life and death situations as a medic. Um, and I just can't even imagine that you're, you're on the beach with some of your brothers. And next thing you know, the guy next to you is getting shot and he's face down in the dirt. And then you have another guy who got his legs blown off and his entrails are coming out. Like this movie is very gory. (laughs) <laughs> very gory yeah that's one so, of the main things i remember is just all the the gore and the blood and i mean it's real that's that's, that's what, what happens happened. you shoot someone uh they're gonna bleed yeah. <laughs> and you know that that led to this movie came out in 1999 so uh you it know it looks have, incredible for 1999 though it yeah, does it's aged very well it does i watched it recently <laughs> obviously because i'm doing an episode on it but <laughs> It's it's one of those things where you're like, wow, this could have been made today, and it still mm-hmm. would have been awesome. I mean, literally the the word awesome in its original meaning, which is awe inspiring, because mm-hmm. um, that beach scene is just rough to watch, um, unless you're unless you're in high school watching it and you're you know goofing around with your friends, which that was me. Um, <laughs> oh, what a lie. good goof off movie! It, good call. Yeah, it's. Um, I don't know. I, I still have a sick, twisted sense of humor, I guess. But um, <laughs> the thing is that a lot of history teachers make you watch this, not make you watch this. So you have to sign a waiver, of course. But uh, it's one of those movies in high school where they, they sit you down and they're like, all right, we're going to we're going to learn about World War Two. And they start you off with this movie. And it's like, holy shit. <laughs> That's really what happened. <laughs> For me, that school experience was uh, having to watch the boy in the striped pajamas. Oh, what was yeah. that about? It's about uh, the Holocaust and okay. there's this little boy who's in a concentration camp and there's this little boy whose family lives very close to the concentration camp because his dad runs it and this little boy and the boy inside the camp meet across the fence and they become friends. Oh. And um, I won't spoil it for anybody who wants to watch it, but it will destroy you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I can only imagine what happens. Yeah. Like very bad things. Uh, bad through things. And through. Um, so you get past the beach landing scene and now we get the introduction to the premise of the movie. Like I said before, you got to save private Ryan, private Ryan's the only one of his brothers that is still alive at the end of all this. And it, you got to save him. So there you go. There's the movie. Yeah. Get him out of there. <laughs> get him out. Get him out of there. That's what it's I a think rescue what it, mission. It's a rescue mission. Essentially. Like Wonder yeah, pets. Yeah. Not like oh. wonder pets. You don't. I guess that's the only similarity to Wonder Pets is that it's a restoration. <laughs> Sorry, it I pretty just pretty much ends that, there. <laughs> that offers that offers the mental picture of saving Private Ryan with the Wonder Pets cast, and I just can't have that right now. <laughs> the little turtle has no problem getting off the boat. He's just like, whatever, I'm swimming. I don't give a <laughs> Well <laughs> The duck. The duck would be fine. Yeah. The duck doesn't be. make it past the beach. No. Nah. Bruh. <laughs> A lot of people didn't, <laughs> but, um, so they get past the beach scene. They, they establish, I think it's three or two days afterwards. They cut to a scene where they're, they're setting up camp pretty much. Um, the, the main objective is they have to get tanks on the beach. Um, and I don't know if they did that at Omaha beach or one of the other beach that our, our allies landed on, but that's what they're trying to do. Pretty much. You send the soldiers in there first, then you bring in the tanks. It's, it's kind of like, I won't get into the strategy of it, but it's, it's called combine arms. It's when you Mm -hmm. take, uh, aircraft tanks and everything and you combine them into one like unit. And that's when you, you know, you do things, you fight a war with it. Mm -hmm. Um, so right out, 
it's kind of established that the soldiers and Captain Miller's squad, they think the mission's kind of bullshit. <laughs> they're risking the lives of eight dudes for one. And they're kind of joking around. They're like, dude, this is foobar. Then you get that classic scene where uh, uh, Private Upham or Private First Class, maybe he's a corporal. Uh, these are different ranks within the army, of course. But he's like, um, what's a foobar? Is that, is that a German word? Because he's kind of like this clueless guy. And the only reason why he's on he's this the mission, interpreter. He's the interpreter. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Because he speaks both French and German. And he's kind of like the scrawny kid. He's kind of like Steve Rogers before the serum, if you want to picture that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, got it. Okay, got it. Okay. And he's the, <laughs> he's kind of the scrawny kid and he's he's holding this big old battle rifle. And you know, those things are heavy. So <laughs> it's just funny to watch. And what's a foobar? They have that scene and of course, it means fucked up beyond all recognition. That's mm. that's what it means. Military loves their acronyms, but uh, so eventually they they make their way. They're they're crossing this French countryside, and it's it's very pretty out there. If you haven't been, I haven't been honestly. Full disclosure, <laughs> um, but <laughs> they eventually make pretty. it to a little French town, and uh, I think Vin Diesel's character um, he tries to to get a kid. He tries to rescue a kid. It's not like a pedophilia thing or anything like that. The the family is offering up their little daughter. <laughs> we wouldn't have thought that unless you said it. I'm just yeah, saying. Yeah, we've, we've had to stop the podcast a couple of Nick episodes to be like, <laughs> hey. You did not have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want you to think that's where it was going. Uh, Great. <laughs> quick, quick clarification. Let's move on. <laughs> quick, quick clarification. It was following along at home. Uh, Thank the, God. The, the parents are, they're crying. They're speaking in French to him. And they're like, you know, you got to take our kid. You got to take our kid. Cause their house is like half gone. Pretty much it's been bombed. Um, and Captain Miller's like, don't, don't you do it. Don't you do it. He of course does it. He t- t- gets the kid down from the second story. Um, and then shortly after he gets shot and he's bleeding out and he has this letter and he's shaking as he takes his last breaths. And, uh, I don't know. That's that's just a really slap in the face scene because you think this guy's just trying to do something right. He's doing something that I would probably do, and how he gets punished for it is death. So, well, what's the letter? I uh, I think it's a letter to his dad. Um, or maybe it's his girlfriend or something like that. I don't remember, but he's he's basically just trying to offer it up, like, hey, this is it's my last will and testament. Please make sure it gets copied and all that. So, jeez. Yeah, it's pretty rough. Um, it does not get easier from here. No, it does not. Yeah. <laughs> Things go from that bad is, to worse. That is the whole point of this movie. Yep. You basically watch this happen to almost every single person, which we may get to on this rescue mission or something equally as bad. When you get to the end, you're like, they have to save Private Ryan or none mm-hmm. of this was worth it. And that's yeah. exactly what like the the general was thinking like, Mm -hmm. yeah, people might die saving this guy, but if we don't save him, then his mother will always be like, what was all this for? Yeah, exactly. It was kind of a PR mission. I think is how they labeled it or how the soldiers in the squad were labeling it as, cause Mm -hmm. it's just a PR mission. I'm not, what am I doing out here? What the hell? I should be back on the beaches helping my other brothers, you know, push, push the line forward. Cause eventually they're going to Berlin. Um, that's kind of like the whole thing they're trying to do. Um, but there's one quote that's brought up in the movie. It's, uh, and it's kind of funny because the sniper is saying prayers all throughout the movie. Uh, the marksman in the squad, I forget, I think his name is private Jackson, but, um, he's kind of a badass. I'll just say that up front. (laughs) He's, uh, he's quite the, uh, quite the sharpshooter, but I just mentioned him because the, the quote is if God be for us, who can be against us because you got to wonder like yeah i know nazi germany wasn't big on religion but they're probably praying to their god too and if they're the same god if they're the same you know christian worshiping people that we are who's who's the good guys here who's gonna is god gonna swoop down and be like all right uh this is the side i'm choosing like i don't know in a roundabout way yeah because i mean i don't think at that point the allies were really aware of like the concentration camps and um, 
just the horrible things going on in Nazi Germany. But um, yeah, it's like, I don't know who's, who's, who's going to be the victor here. Right. Um, and then of course there's the classic phrase of war as hell. It brings out the best and worst of any man. Uh, just think of, there's, there's another scene that I wanted to bring up where the uh, 22 men die in a glider accident because at this point they're kind of sending in gliders. Uh, they're unpowered aircraft pretty much. And they're sending them in to, uh, to drop paratroopers. And this particular glider that gets crashed and the guy flying it, explaining a story. He's like, yeah, there's a brigadier general in the glider and we had to armor the underside of it. So it handled like a freight train and 22 men died. And you kind of see that drawn in comparison to there's eight men risking their lives for one person. Like the movie even calls into a parallel right there, then and there. Um, so then later on, after the movie goes on, uh, well, before I go, let me, let me go back there. And that same scene, I think right after it is, uh, he offers them a bag of dog tags and Captain Miller's men are kind of going through it. They're making jokes like, ho, 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 look at this guy. And all while this, uh, this column of paratroopers is walking by him and they're looking at him like, what? Those were, those were our brothers that just died. The dog tags represent a death. Yeah, I was going to say those are presumably all dead men. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's kind of messed up. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things that I guess it's soldiers just trying to have a little fun despite the... <laughs> just blowing off a little steam. Just blowing off a little steam, you know, counting dog tags. But I think it's... Death. It kind of goes into, like, the discussion of trauma and... I like made an offhanded joke earlier in the podcast about like disassociative episodes. And that's why I like can't remember things. Yeah. But like to an extent, when you're going through hell like that and you want to just separate yourself from it, everything becomes a joke because it's like, if I don't laugh, I'm going to cry. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, like these, I can't in my brain make these dog tags represent real men because mm -hmm. that's too hard for me. And that's why we joke about it is because these are just dog tags to us because I yeah. can't handle the weight of it being a real man. Mm. Yeah, it's a great point. It's it's almost like a memento mori. Uh, that's an it's an old Italian word for a uh, reminder of death. Mm. Like, yeah, it's all around you. What are you going to do about it? There's not much you can do. So except for laugh. I mean, that's that's laughter is the best medicine, right? So it's one of them. It's one of them. One of many. <laughs> That I'm on no. also, the, <laughs> also the the Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson Johnson vaccine. Right, that's true. Get your vaccine, guys. Okay, get your vaccine. I'm Cover. fully vaccinated. I live Meyer. I'm still fertile. All that. Walgreens. Walgreens. <laughs> Meyer. <laughs> uh, everything still works. Okay, um, <laughs> but eventually they they move a little further into enemy territory or occupied France. And they see a German machine gun outpost. They're, they're kind of set up in this abandoned uh, radar facility. It's a big concrete building, and it's got like a, a grill type of thing on top. It's early radar, basically. Um, and they're like, Captain Miller's like, all right, all right I'm going to take this. I know it's not part of the mission, but I got to do it. And they have this bickering contest where they're like, dude, we just have to save Private Ryan. Why are we doing this? And he says, well, if we don't destroy this machine gun outpost, it's going to be waiting for our boys when they come through. So that's one of the good things. Like Captain Miller is a good guy. That's that's the one thing you have to walk away from, the, mm -hmm. from this knowing is that, yeah, he's here to save Private Ryan. But at the but end of the there's day, there's also a chance that they don't. And if they did some good things along the way, then it was still worth something. Yeah, it's kind of like a parallel to the to the guy trying to get the kid from the parents. Mm -hmm. Like he's yeah. trying to save a life. But in the end, it bites him in the ass. Um, and the same thing happens here too. the. The medic um, who's with the squad, he gets, you know, he gets shot and he's on the ground. He's and it's this, it's this horrible, heart wrenching scene where they're, they're giving him morphine um, to ease the pain, obviously. And, uh, and I think his last words are like mommy or something like that. Um, basically, it's just like, oof, you didn't need to do that to me, Steven Spielberg. But <laughs> yes, he damn did. it. You did. This is the man who made Schindler's List. Of course he did. Yep, he made that movie right before this one. So, well, I want to do a little sidebar here because oh, I want to know what you both think about the phrase "no good deed goes unpunished." 
no good deed goes unpunished. Mm -hmm. Because I think it kind of, it lines up with what we've been talking about. You know, you try to do something good and end up getting shot. Yeah. I don't know if it's punishment or just like every good deed requires some, some form of struggle. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I think it, I think it comes down to at the end of the day, you're there's always going to be a cost for all of your deeds, whether they be good or bad. Sometimes Mm -hmm. the reward for doing bad deeds is greater than the reward for doing good. I mean, at the same time, you could argue that no bad deed goes unpunished to some extent. Mm -hmm. Um, But that being said, um, with the phrase, no good deed goes unpunished. What I would, what I would say from it is that um, like, if you're doing good and you're putting good in the world, then even if there is some sort of punishment that comes along with it at the end of the day, it's kind of like a game where you build up karma because people are going to be like, Mm. Oh, that's a good man. And that's like the ultimate reward, you know? Yeah. I I see you're kind of bleeding the previous episode with this one a little bit because you study philosophy, you think about it. That just, it's true. Yeah. You started it. No, I didn't. Get out of here. (laughs) (laughs) Guys, no fighting. Come on, let's leave a nice house for Michael to come back to. <laughs> but like we just had that, you know, bickering in air quotes. Uh, people have disagreements, even if they're fighting a war. Uh, eventually, it's revealed that Captain uh, Miller is a school teacher, and he was that for 11 years before the war. People are just out here fighting for their lives. And before that, they had like an actual job where they sat down at a desk and they taught kids. So, uh, how do you even go back to living a normal life after you've experienced all this? It it's pretty hard. And it's kind of wrapped up in this quote from the movie where uh, I forget who says, it. I think it's Captain Miller, but he says, every man I kill, the farther away from home, I feel just imagine coming home and trying to tell your significant other what happened. They can't relate. They weren't over here with you. These memories are very powerful things, but ultimately they can't really be explained in full detail. Right. I mean, so many veterans come home with anxiety, depression, PTSD, like they can't go back to work. They can't do things they used to enjoy. Yeah. It's awful. It's it's horrible. But at the end, it's (laughs) it's like you said, Alex, war. What is it good for? Absolutely Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Okay. Um, So they're walking through the field. Once again, it's a lot of field walking for these guys. And then. Out of this, uh, out of this, uh, I guess forest comes this this German half track, um, which is think of this like big beefy armored tank looking thing, and a couple allies show up. They got a bazooka, pop, boom, it blows up, and wouldn't you know it, it's good old James Francis Ryan of Iowa holding the bazooka. They found him. They did it. So woohoo, we did it. We found Private Ryan. Now can we save him? I don't know. Eventually. They're 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 defending a bridge over an important river. The Germans say uh, basically this is a critical bridge. If the Germans take it, that's it. I mean, all is all for nothing. Of course, there's probably ways around that. Of course, but um, saving Private Ryan is the one good thing they could do in this entire mess. And kind of cut to uh, Private Upham being a coward. But wouldn't you? Of course, he he has multiple opportunities to kill this German guy, and he's having a conversation with him in the scene before this, and he's like, "Oh, I I don't like Hitler, you know, fuck Hitler, and all this." And eventually, he gets to go free. But later on in the movie, you see this good thing being punished, and he's on the firing line shooting at people that are trying to defend the bridge. It's <laughs> it's like you can't make this stuff up, whether it's true or not. Yeah, but. His good deed is, of course, punished. But by the end of the movie, Upham re- redeems himself and he, he shoots him, uh, I don't know where, but it's a it's a kill shot. It just goes to show that you can't forget the past. And sometimes our stories that we tell can serve as some sort of comfort. And the stories that these soldiers tell while they're just sitting there shooting the shit, they're downright hilarious. There's <laughs> there's one uh, story that a, story, uh, a soldier tells and... It's of this uh, well-endowed woman, shall we say, trying to fit into a dress that is too small for her. And <laughs> it's just, I can't do it justice because the way they tell it is just funny. It goes to show that like combat is 
or fighting a war is 90% just sitting around and 10% actual combat. So at the end of the movie, you kind of are left with this, have you earned it type of thing? That's what the guy says. He says, he says to his wife, of course, this is private Ryan, the old guy. Remember we cut back to present day. That classic mm-hmm. gif where it goes from young Matt Damon to old Matt Damon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and spoiler alert, all of the people in the squad die, of course, except for private Ryan. Um, what does he mean by earn it? Well, he says, he says the exact quote is tell me I've lived a good life. So <laughs> damn, if you don't cry at the end of this movie, I don't know what's wrong with you, but it was, it's just this enormous debt of gratitude that we owe to the brave men and women that fought world war II. I mean, both overseas and at home because everyone was in the crosshairs, but whether you agree with what happened or not, one thing is true. These people were brave and tough as nails like I can't imagine what these guys went through. And beyond that, I think that what he meant by tell me I've lived a good life is have I earned the deaths of eight people to save my life? And I don't know if there's really a way to earn that. I don't think that's a question you can answer. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's almost like survivor's guilt. I think Mm -hmm. Um, it's like, gosh, how do I pay off this enormous karmic debt that's been placed upon my head uh, and you really can't. I mean, you can do your best and try and yeah. live a good life, but at the end of the day, it meant people di- it, people died to save your ass. So it's rough. Yeah, it's you just better a rough be at movie. the soup kitchen every weekend. Yeah, <laughs> you better be going to church, saying your prayers, <laughs> going to the soup kitchen. You know. No, but I think that is probably a lot of you know we were talking about how hard it is for veterans coming back, like they've left all these people behind, and they're like. Why wasn't it me? I think survivor's guilt is very real for them. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I don't hear a lot of people talk about it. So this was a lovely tribute, especially on Memorial Day week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's kind of why I figured now is a good time to talk about it. Because you got, got Memorial Day just behind us. You got D-Day right in front of us. So yeah, it's kind of the best of all possible places to put a little tongue-in-cheek reference to World War II. I don't know. Uh, but World War II, and I think this movie is significant, uh, because after the war, of course, we get the United Nations, which is a great thing that all our countries from across the world participate in. It's trying to be a great thing. It's doing its best. It's it really doing is. Its best. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we haven't had World War Three yet, so yeah, that's kind of why it was set up to do that. Um, so there's see, that. this is that setup for that meme with like Bart and Homer, where <laughs> Bart's like, "Well, we haven't had World War Three, and then Homer like leans down and puts his hand on Bart's shoulder and is like, "We haven't had World War Three yet <laughs> <laughs> this is the worst or day we've I've only ever had, had two world wars so far so far <laughs> worst day so far <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh it could happen who knows but you get this rise of the ideology of postmodernism, like i mentioned before it's mm-hmm. this lack of trust in organized institutions pretty much um after world war ii you see a rise of women in the workforce because of rosie the riveter and all this other propaganda that they're pushing out. Um, oh man. They finally had to admit that women are good for the workforce because sometimes men aren't around. <laughs> did did League of Their Own happen at the same time as Saving Private Ryan? I I don't know. Like are they set in the same time? Like are they yeah, like are the women playing baseball playing baseball because all the men were at World War II? And Hold if that's on. the case, is there a cinematic universe where Tom Hanks is simultaneously saving Private Ryan? <laughs> It could be. I don't know. <laughs> Jeez. Um, I didn't know Madonna was in that. Interesting. Gosh, wow. It's been a long time since I've seen it. Um, let's see. Is this another it movie to watch? It is 1988. No. 1943. Yeah. 43. Yay, when World 43. War II threatens to shut down Major League Baseball, persuades his fellow owners to bankroll the Women's League. Nice going, Alex. Hey, what a pull. What an <laughs> awesome pull. <laughs> Do you have a closing statement, Nick, that you have written out, or have we already made it past connected. that part? Uh, we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, okay, cool. So <laughs> don't rush it. Don't don't rush me. Um, <laughs> this is one of those times where we talk about global warfare, and this is a true global war. Every country from around the world is involved in some form or fashion, and as a result of that, it's a total war. Everyone inside a country is a target, and you know civilians are being killed, and homes are destroyed. The human cost of this is 73 million lives on both sides when all was said and done, including 
419,000 American lives. That's pretty insane. So just think like 3.5 million people have died from COVID globally to put things in kind of a modern day time frame. But, mm -hmm. and that's just all fatalities. I mean, just think of all the people that are coming back from physical ailments, wounds, shrapnel scars, missing limbs, and the psychological scars that you can't see. Mm -hmm. People like to look at World War II as the last good war. It was the last one with clear good and evil, clear black and white. But I mean, is it really good? Was it really clear cut? I don't know. And you get this thing where I ask you once again, what do you think this film is about? <laughs> because beyond that, I think this film is worth your time and it's significant for a number of reasons. Are you guys still in agreement of why you thought the film was about really? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I don't want to get too into it because this is kind of, like we said, it's a good memorial episode. And I personally have a lot of opinions against uh, war and mm -hmm. any kind of politics that get wrapped up in it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at the end of the day, there's, yeah. there's always a batch of shit cooking, you know, and if, <laughs> you know what happened before and you know what mistakes they made. There's a chance that you don't make those mistakes again as a society. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well said. Uh, Steven Spielberg, the director said that I think world war II is the most significant event of the last hundred years. The fate of the baby boomers and even generation X was linked to the outcome. And beyond that, I've always been interested in world war II. for years. Now I've been looking for the right world war II movie to shoot. And, Robert Rodette, who of course wrote Saving Private Ryan, and he says, I found it. So this is kind of his magnum opus. This is his love letter to the, the people that fought in World War II. Mm -hmm. And this is based off a true story. You might not know that, but it's the true story of the Nilland brothers, who were four brothers from Tonawanda, New York, who also fought during World War II. Two survived the war, but at the time, only one, Fritz Nilland, was believed to be alive. And um, so the... the they get these reports that all three of his brothers are dead and they go and they pull him out of occupied France. Um, of course, one actually does survive uh, Japanese internment, um, but they didn't know that at the time. So uh, were these brothers American citizens? Yep. Yep. I wonder if maybe they were immigrants though, with a name like Fritz. Uh, Fritz, Fritz was a shortened name. It was Frederick. Oh, okay. That was kind of like his nickname, but um, they were Irish immigrants. Um, okay. And this was kind of at the time where we're just getting over the the whole Irish hating thing. Yeah. We've moved on to German <laughs> hating now, so. <laughs> I um, want to hate somebody. I want to hate somebody. I want to hate somebody. <laughs> that's, that's tell something. me who to hate or I'll hate other Americans. <laughs> We've always hated other Americans, unfortunately. Um but that story, the story of Private Ryan brings up the question of how many lives are worth putting at risk to save one? And like you said, that's not a question you can freely and openly answer. But uh, the Avengers say that we don't trade lives. Then what do you do with them? You we try sell to them. save them all. <laughs> we sell them for money. No, <laughs> <laughs> we don't, don't accept trade. <laughs> I don't trade stonks. <laughs> um, stonks only go up. You'd hope. <laughs> but at the end of the day, yes, it's a war film, but it's not meant to glorify warfare in any way. And I think everyone with a working brain agrees that this is a horrible time for everyone involved. And I think the movie shows that with a great level of detail. It's not all heroism and happy endings. People die. There's pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. it's showcasing humanity at its absolute worst and its best. The extremes. Uh, this is it one of the Spielberg worst of times. It was the best of times. <laughs> Spielberg's film contain many similar themes throughout his work. And one of the most pertinent themes, I think, for this movie is ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. Ordinary people often have limitations, but they succeed in becoming a hero. And it's this thing where the the end, end kind of punchline is that the goodness of humanity will prevail, even in the darkest and the worst of times, such as warfare. Um. So a fun fact, not so fun fact, I guess, is the D-Day scene was so realistic that 
some of the veterans of World War II that were actually still alive and watching the movie couldn't watch it. They walked out of the theater. Oof. And that was even hard for me to watch. So I can't imagine if you were actually there and experiencing that trauma then. That I'm surprised they even wanted to go. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't can't know imagine reliving to. something like that. I guess they wanted to do it. It's kind of like eating spicy things where you're like, I know, you know this it's going to hurt, but I got to do it. I love it. <laughs> I got to do it. <laughs> I'll stop making an appropriate metaphor someday. Uh, <laughs> well, film. you know, you have to laugh or you'll cry. Alex was totally right. Man, Alex you have to make comedy out of it or it's just going to hurt. Wow. Um, so beyond all that, this is kind of a lighthearted note to end on it. But this film led to the creation of the Call of Duty franchise of video games because that was based off Medal of Honor, which is developed by the movie's director, Steven Spielberg. What? <laughs> True story. Um, I had no idea. Yeah, and this film is, you know, it's it's labeled as one of the best films of all time. It won a, a bunch of awards. You can go look them up. And it performed really well in the box office. And I'll see if I can once, get some numbers. Yes, please. And once again, it's worth mentioning, Tom Hanks is on a roll in the 90s. He's got <laughs> Castaway, Forrest Gump, Toy Story, Apollo 13. Delicious League of Their Disney. Own. League of Their Own, probably. <laughs> yeah, he was in that too. Tom Hanks, what a guy. He really popped off. He was popping. So, <laughs> <laughs> Chloe, do you have any numbers before we get into the conclusion segment? Um, let's see. In the box office, it made 70 million worldwide. Mm. Uh, 30 million in the opening weekend. Let's see. I don't know if IMDB lists awards. I guess it, it does. A lot of them. Yeah, I'm sure it did. A hmm, lot, a lot of them. So, in my closing thoughts here, uh, first I'll ask you guys, is there any closing thoughts about this movie? No. <laughs> uh, it's <laughs> it's beautiful, but it hurts. It's going to hurt. It's hard to watch. Yep. So, in conclusion, um, there's no way to give this a happy, uplifting theme, okay? World War II is something that everyone is at least aware of. And a lot of what happened is what folks would call the last good war. But in the end, it wasn't good. Yes, in the end, we stopped a weird German art kid from doing bad things, but at what cost? War doesn't determine who is right, only who is left. In every scene of Private Ryan, you're left with that question. Is my life worth the sacrifice of the people that came before me? Or maybe it's a question of why even fight with one another that it prevails in your head. I mean... Understand that, yeah, we're going to disagree from time to time, but when it comes to fistfights or bloodshed, surely there's a way to settle this without it coming to that. Remember the old phrase, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. In a world mm -hmm. that has never known forgiveness, the hot anger and revenge overrode the feelings of calm and cool-headedness that we so, so sorely needed in those times. Now, I'm not saying World War II could have been avoided, but if we all sat around a campfire and sang Kumbaya, that'd be great too, <laughs> but... <laughs> We're just evolved gorillas on a rock hurtling through space. And isn't it best if we just be awesome to one another? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be up front with you. I this love your outros. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't in good faith say that, hey, everyone, go watch Private Ryan. But if you want a greater appreciation for the shit that these folks went through on the beaches and in France, and you've got a pretty strong stomach, then this movie is for you. <laughs> and in the end, I think we're all Private Ryan in some capacity because somebody has saved us whether we know it or not. And whether you think that World War II is stupid or not, it's important to note that this is a big deal for a lot of people. And for the rest of us, it continues to show aftershocks in the planet around us today. Think of the entire generation slay and the lives torn apart and the new philosophies that are born from it. Because after all, those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. Thank you, Nick. Well done. A fun little tidbit before we go to promos. Uh, Saving Please, Private Rhyme was nominated for 11 Academy Awards. Um, it won five, including Best Cinematography, Best Sound, Best Sound Effects Editing, Best Film Editing, and Best Director. But it lost Best Picture to Shakespeare in Love, which some people say is like the biggest Oscar snub of all time. Is that even a good film? I haven't seen Shakespeare in Love. It's really good. It. It's not Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> We'll see about that. It's just like, it's a silly Shakespeare love movie. People were really surprised at one best picture. 
Yeah. People were just in the mood in the late nineties. I know. I, I guess. Was. Let's go to promos. Yeah. Okay. Big fat mood. <laughs> to promos. Justin Wallace, Mitch Glasgow, and Deanna Cosby. Three daily commuters are joining forces to create the comedy podcast known as Carpool Shenanigans. Each week we'll take a topic, tell a story, and hopefully make your drive to work just a little less shitty. Now the episode's about to begin, so we ask that you sit back, relax, and of course, let's get weird. Hey, Cammie. Hey, Bryant. What do Robin Hood, Vlad the Impaler, and Mothman have in common? IDK, what? Well, they're all topics on our podcast, Mystery, where each week we discuss a new myth and the history behind it. That's Myth Story with an I-E. See you then. Oh! Welcome back, folks. Thank you for sitting through those little promos. Uh, as our uh, loyal fans know... Uh, we have a segment on our show called a quick this. What a quick this is, is we spend five minutes talking about a topic that maybe we didn't think we could stretch into an entire episode, but we do want to talk about. Uh, I hosted last week. We talked about Good Place. And <laughs> this week I have brought to you uh, a classic Alex bit, which is I'm mad about something. Let's talk about it. <laughs> what are you mad about? What's on your mind? We'll get to that. But Ready? let's go ahead and start the clock. Go. Ooh, cool. So, Ready. Boom, Either go. whether you know about uh, Michael Jordan or you don't, there are some things that are just universally known about him, whether it's the shoe brand or the basketball. Uh, everything about Michael Jordan has kind of been public eye. He's been playing in the uh, early uh, NBA since uh, 1984. He's been playing um, and he got his first three peat, meaning he won three championships in 1993. It was briefly after that that he stepped away from the limelight uh, due to, first off, some uh, gambling things that he was dealing with at the time. But furthermore, in case you didn't know, he stepped away uh, because of the death of his father. I don't know if anybody knows this. This is a little bit sad. Uh, but his father was actually murdered by two men um, who stole his Lexus that was bearing the license plate UNC 0023 because Michael Jordan played for the University of North Carolina and his number was 23. Mm. Um, his body was dumped in a South Carolina swamp and was not discovered until August 3rd. This wow. is stuff about Michael Jordan's father that I didn't know going into this. Mm. Um, and the two people were caught and convicted because they used his cell phone to make some calls uh, and they were sentenced to life in prison. So they got their comeuppets. Good. But because of this, Michael Jordan, who was a huge fan of his father, so much so that he um, even adopted his father's signature tongue out face when his father was absorbed with work. And now he famously is known for doing the tongue out when going up for the basket uh, for like a slam dunk and things like that. Like that. Um, yeah, kind of like that. Oh, OK, <laughs> <laughs> guys, we're, we're an audio medium. Oh, oh okay. sorry. You guys we have to watch that out. video if you want to see the tongues out. <laughs> um, tongues out. He later revealed that th this death of his father and his uh, love for his father uh, would be the reason why he surprised fans by quitting basketball completely at one point in 1993 after his first three-peat and would go into minor league baseball. Uh, because his father said that he had always dreamed of uh, Michael Jordan being a major league baseball player. This was his attempt to make it in the major leagues to honor his father. Um, the team that he played for was owned by the same people who owned the uh, Chicago Bulls. So he was able to actually play under his basketball contract. So that was a little thing that they did for him. Hmm. So as we all know, he, of course, came back and continued being an all-star basketball player. But to announce him coming back, he, there was a, a special thing that happened that all of us know so well as the movie Space Jam. Oh, yeah. 
in the movie space jam Jam. correct (laughs) in the movie space jam we see michael jordan retire from basketball and begin playing um minor league baseball just as he did in real life and to kind of serve as an answer to the question what happened to michael jordan from 1993 to 1994 This movie was created uh, by, of course, Warner Brothers Studios, along with Michael Jordan, um, to say that Michael Jordan, for the year from 1993 to 1994, was instead transported to a different universe where he played basketball with the Looney Tunes. (laughs) He was transferred to the Looney Tunes universe itself. The Looney Tunes, if you will. I will. To save... To save the Looney Tunes from uh, being forced to be entertainment slaves at an alien theme park. This is how Michael Jordan wanted to tell his fans, hey, I'm coming back. And when this movie came out, nobody knew. But because of the heartbreaking reason why he left in the first place, I'm aware. I have the timer, too. Um, (laughs) Because of the heartbreaking reason that he left in the first place, people were just like, yeah, that's okay. You could totally come back and we're going to do this big thing to like get your name out there again and make you just as famous as you were before. And everybody went and saw Space Jam and they loved it. So it was a great reason to make the movie. You know, it's a terrible reason to make the movie because you want to make money off of it. Space Jam 2 doesn't need to happen. Uh, LeBron James hasn't earned it. LeBron James is a big old crybaby in the basketball world. I don't care how much he, uh, how many points he scored. I don't care who is giant fans of him or his team. He is not Michael Jordan. He does not deserve a Space Jam movie. And this is Hollywood's attempt to make money off of you because you liked the first one that was made for a good reason. Thank you and good night. Oh, wow. Well done. But Loki had still watched the sequel if they made one. Have you seen the trailer? They they no. made it. It has a You it has should a watch trailer. the trailer and it's then pointless. get back to us. It's useless. It's stupid. It's CGI. They didn't draw the Looney Tunes. The Looney Tunes are famously cartoons. Right. And they made them CGI. And this they're like, oh, we have access to a bunch of other stuff. Let's throw the Iron Giant in there. This it's is stupid. So the world's stupid. on fire. Go watch Bo Burnham's Inside. Let's do the outro. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, as always, if there's something that you want to see us cover on the show that we haven't covered yet, we are always up for suggestions. You can do that by emailing us at entertainthis at gmail.com, but you can also reach out to our multiple social medias. For example, our Twitter is entertain underscore this. You can also find us on Instagram. Our username is entertain this podcast. We have a Facebook group. If you look up entertain this with three dots, you're surely to find us by our logo. It's right there up in the corner over by Chloe over Wait. there. Look for that logo on all those things and you're sure to find us. You can also find us on YouTube if you look up Entertain This with the three dots. Make sure you add those three dots. Uh, And you can watch all of our uh, back catalog of episodes um, Mm -hmm. and their video components that go along with them. So you can see things like us doing weird dances, making faces at each other, or maybe just sticking our tongues out in reference to Michael Jordan. Um, (laughs) Another way that you can contact us is check out our website. It's entertainthis.net. There is a handy dandy little survey that you can fill out at the bottom where you can send a message straight to our email. So you don't even have to write up your own little email, like log into your Y mail and type the shit up and add a subject. You don't have to do all that. You just fill out that little document. There's no need to do it. Uh, (laughs) We usually respond to everything. And if it's something that we feel like we can't cover, you may land yourself a guest spot on our show to talk about it with us. If that's something that interests you, but as always entertain us. So we can entertain you, and you can entertain this. We'll see you next Friday. Goodbye! Bye! Bye. This episode of Entertain This was written by me, Nick Mustakangas, with additional commentary from Alex Steele and Chloe Price, who is also our showrunner and resident fact checker. Our theme music is Rush Hubble by Aaron Spencer, with additional interstitial music by DJW. Tune in every Friday for new episodes, and thanks for listening.